How many of you have seen the Avengers movies? Okay, okay. So there's, I think it's Samuel Jackson, right? Now, Samuel Jackson is often in the background. And if I remember correctly, he's kind of like the mediator between these shadowy figures that, that sort of exist as, I don't know, they, look, they all look like middle-aged white men, and they're sort of like a power <laughs> group, and they communicate on screen. I don't know exactly who they are, but um, Jackson plays an intermediary. But he is lacking an eye. And part of the reason you infer that Jackson is, is lacking an eye is because he's had a pretty long history of being involved in catastrophe. And, you know, one consequence of that is that he's become damaged. Well, the same thing happens to Horace. So Horace goes back and he says to Seth, I see you for who you are. I know what you're up to. You're working for destruction. You want to take the state apart. There's nothing positive about what you're doing. You facilitate deception. So I'm taking the state back. So they have a big fight. And during the fight, Seth tears out one of Horus's eyes. You've all seen the image of the Egyptian eye, right? Everyone knows that image, even now, which is pretty cool. So it's got a, an eyebrow, and it's, it's got an eye in the middle, and then it's got the iris, and usually the pupil is so big that it covers the whole iris. And there's a variety of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is, is that that symbolizes interest and attention. So when you're interested in something, your pupil grows. And so Horace's pupil is really big, and he's checking things out like mad. So Horace is the eye, and he's also a falcon. And you might say, well, why is he a falcon? And the answer to that is, falcons are birds of prey, and they can really see. So that's another amplification of the idea of the eye. Now, falcons fly up above everything, even above the pyramids. And they can see wherever they want to see. And so Horus is the thing that flies up above the structures of mankind in some sense and can see them panoramically. So he's not encapsulated in any particular pyramid. He's the thing that's above all pyramids and looking and, and providing you with an overview. All right. So, and I think the best way to conceptualize Horus in modern terms is, is attention. That's not thought. That's a whole different thing. Like attention is what thought... Attention is the precursor to thought, in a sense. Attention is where you meet meaning. That's another way of thinking about it, you know? Attention is actually where you take undifferentiated chaos and start to turn it into order. And you think about, it. how much do you like being paid attention to? People love that. Children, like, you don't pay attention to them they become pathological. You don't pay attention to your partner, your relationship dissolves. No one pays attention to you, you crawl off in a corner and die. Advertisers pay for your attention. Like, attention, that's a currency, man. That's value. So, you know, and, and you like to be paid attention to when you do good things, and maybe you'll even do terrible things so that someone pays attention to you. Attention's a big deal. We don't understand it very well, but anyways, the the Egyptians conceptualized it as a god. That's, a, that's smart. That's a very smart idea. Anyways, Horus grows up in the underworld. And then, you know, when he gets kind of big and ready to contend with the world, he thinks, I'm going to take the damn state back from my evil uncle. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to grow up, pay attention, get yourself the hell out of the underworld, and then take your state back from your evil uncle. Okay, so what happens? So Horus, he gets himself all prepared, and he's, you know, he's son of order and chaos, man. He's no second-rate character. You're supposed to come out of the underworld. You're supposed to see what the hell's going on. You're supposed to go back and take the state away from archaic, its archaic institutions and willful blindness. But if you really contend with that, you better look out, because it, you're contending with something that you can barely master. Anyways, Horus beats Seth, despite the fact that he has his eye torn out. And so then he tells Seth to go outside the boundaries of the kingdom and to never come back. Well, why doesn't he kill him? Well, he can't. He's a god. You can't get rid of Seth. Seth is the deity of the decomposition of states. That's not going away. The best you can do is hold it at bay for periods of time. And you have to be awake and aware of its constant presence. Anyways, he chases Seth away, but he gets his eye back. And so, 
he, he reclaims his consciousness from the malevolent, from, from malevolence, essentially. And then you might think, okay, well, what should he do? He should slap that eye back in his head, and then, you know, he's defeated evil, so now he should be king. And that would be a good ending to the story. But that isn't what the Egyptians do, and this is where they really get brilliant, in my estimation. So Horus takes his eye, and he goes back to the underworld. So he does this voluntarily. He goes back to the underworld. And he goes back to where Osiris is existing, because it's sort of the land of the dead. And so I, Osiris has this weird existence. He's scattered all over Egypt, but his essence, I suppose, his spirit, is down there in the underworld, which is, it's not exactly hell. Hell is a suburb of the underworld. Like, it's the worst neighborhood of the underworld. That's a good way of thinking about it. You guys go to the underworld fairly often. You may take a rare side trip to hell, and you probably regret it. But, and, and we, can, we can talk about what that means, because it actually has a very specific meaning. Anyways, Osiris isn't in hell. He's just in the underworld. So he's sitting there sort of, you know, inactive and, and in, in rough shape. So Horus goes down to the underworld, and he finds Osiris, and he gives him an eye. And so then Osiris can see again. Remember, he couldn't see. He was willfully blind, right? And so that's partly what led to his demise. So Horus gives him this eye that's been hard fought, right? It's the eye with which he encountered evil. He gives Osiris that eye. It perks him right up. And so then Horus and Osiris go back to the surface world, and they unite to form the ruler of Egypt. And so the idea is that the proper ruler is obviously the thing that can pay attention and conquer the pathology of the state and willful blindness, but it's more than that. It's the thing that does that and then rejuvenates the state. You know, one of the lessons you can derive from Egyptian mythology is bloody well stay awake and make the little corrections when you need to. Don't be willfully blind because if you're willfully blind, you're going to you're going to store up chaos because you're not, you know, keeping at bay. And then one day when you're weak, it's just going to take you out. And that happens. That happens to people all the time. You know, they, they let things around them degenerate back into chaos. And then one day they're weak and something else comes along to hit them and they're done. They can't get up. It's too heavy. It's too hard to hit. And so then they're down in the underworld and they stay there. So... The general rule is if you're going to go to the underworld, it's better to go on purpose and for short voyages. And that's the idea behind voluntary exposure, right? Find out what you don't want to look at. It's easy enough to do that because you're going to see yourself avoiding it. Then figure out how you can approach it and, and order some of it, you know, in as big a chunks as you can manage. And do that all the time. Stay awake because then you keep your infrastructure properly maintained and the probability that you'll be able to tolerate a powerful blow is, is much, much higher. It's not certain. That's the other thing about myths. You know, they tell you the best way to negotiate through life, but they never tell you that that will work. They just tell you that that's your best bet. And so, you know, maybe that's enough. It, it might be enough. You can't leave Osiris, lang Osiris languishing in the underworld you have to give him vision and bring him back up to the surface because I don't care how attentive you are. If you're also not wise, you're not going to be good for anything. And the wisdom is partly the integration of the best your culture has to offer you into your character so that you can be an avatar of culture, an attentive avatar of culture. And then you're a well-balanced soul. Well, so the Egyptians figured all this out. And then it's even cooler than that because... They used this idea of the union of Horus and Osiris as their conceptual representation of what gave the pharaoh sovereignty. Which is, because again, like the Mesopotamians, they were trying to figure out, well, what should rule? You know, what should be above all? And the Mesopotamians figured, well, it's something like Marduk. He's got lots of eyes. He can talk. He's brave. He'll, he'll conquer the unknown. He makes things as a consequence. He makes a pretty good talk god. And the Egyptians added a level of sophistication to that because um, Horus is not only the thing that will go into the underworld, 
he goes into the underworld and he rescues things of tremendous value and then unites with them so that not only can he see, but he's wise. And so then that's what the Pharaoh was supposed to be. And the Egyptians basically characterized that union as something akin to the immortal soul. Now, Iliad attracts this development he called the democratization of Osiris. So first of all, basically only the Pharaoh was allowed to be the Horus-Osiris union in some sense, you know. So, and in, in a way, he was God on earth, you know, and which is a conception, of course, that, that's lasted into cultures for a very, very long period of time. The Japanese still thought that way about their emperor until the end of World War II, and many of them still think that way. So he was the embodiment of divine sovereignty. It was in the leader only. But as the Egyptian state developed, the idea that that soul was an attribute started to descend down the power hierarchy. So after a while, the aristocracy started to use it.